very good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Confabulating. We are honoured to be joined tonight by Professor Rob Eilif of Linica College, Oxford, who will be speaking to us on the subject of the religious views of Sir Isaac Newton. Professor Eilif is a professor of the history of science, whose main research interests include the history of early modern and enlightenment era science, scientific voyages of discovery, the life and work of Isaac Newton, development of ideas about scientific genius and creativity, and the role of scientific instruments in scientific innovation. Professor Eilif is the co-director of the Oxford Centre for the History of Science, Medicine and Technology, and the general editor of the Newton Project. He was also the author of a very short introduction to Newton in 2007, as well as Priests of Nature, the Religious Words of Isaac Newton, published in 2017. Furthermore, he was the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to Isaac Newton, the second edition published in 2016, is current co-editor of the journal Adults of Science, and from 2001 to 2008 was the editor of the journal History of Science. Professor Ryaliff, thank you very much for coming to speak to us tonight. Thanks for having me. So I do believe that the professor has a PowerPoint to show. Do you want to start, Professor? Yeah, great. Well, uh, thanks. I'll see if this works. Uh, I hope it does. Um, I'm going to go to uh, the next slide. Is, is that okay? Can you see that? Perfect. Yep, great. Okay. I'm going to talk for half an hour, really, on various aspects of uh, Newton's um, religious views. Um, uh, I'll talk about his uh, natural philosophy, which is the, the early modern, the older uh, phrase for, for science, and also uh, talk a bit about um, theology rather than religion. I won't get into detail about the, the distinctions. Um, and I'll, at the end, I'll just raise some issues about how we can think about how these things might be related. But along the way, I want to point to um, some of the, the idi idiosyncrasies of Newton's uh, religious thought, the, the, the radical nature of his thinking, uh, perhaps even talk about why it was he had to uh, keep some of these views quiet, uh, private, um, and uh, ultimately um, look at the, uh, the 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 things that link Newton's approach to religion to his approach to science, while also pointing out some of the differences between them. So here's a picture of Newton from uh, from sixteen. Uh, 89, which was when he became a master, uh, member of parliament for Cambridge University in the wake of the, the glorious revolution. And again, I think it's something to, to bear in mind that, that this is only two years after Newton had published his great work, uh, Principia Mathematica, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. The, the fact that he could so easily move from having written this, this master work in the history of uh, the physical sciences to being a, a, a politician um, somebody who was was radically opposed to the the previous kings Charles II and James II, uh, tell you something about the the breadth of thought and the breadth of interests of this uh, extraordinary man. Um, this is a, a picture from 1840 uh, of Newton's house, uh, Walsthorpe Manor. Uh, this was where he was born on Christmas Day, uh, 1642. If you uh, abide by the Julian calendar, which some Protestant nations still did in 1642. I think for most people in the world, Newton was born uh, a year later uh, on January the 4th, 1643. But it's always useful to have Newton born in 1642 because that was the year that Galileo died. So there's a kind of chain of, uh, of, uh, of, of custody, if you like, of, of intellectual dominance. Um, Newton uh, was born in the year that the English uh, went uh, underwent a civil war uh, between the, the parliamentary and uh, the uh, cavalier or royalist factions. Um, and this was one of the most uh, vicious wars in Europe at the time. It's certainly one of the most vicious uh, campaigns in, uh, in the British Isles over the last 1000 years. Uh, you can see it as part of the Thirty Years' War of um, uh, on the European theatre, but in, in England, it, it broke up uh, homes. Uh, it was bloody. Uh, Newton's family were divided. 
Um, and all of this is is in the wake for this young boy of having his father having died before he was born. So he was brought up by his maternal grandmother. Uh, his mother uh, was not in the house many times. She married the local vicar. Uh, Newton's maternal uncle was a, a clergyman in the Church of England. So Newton is um, brought up in a, in a family of people in the Church of England at the very moment when uh, the, the dominance of the Church of England is, is being eroded in the country at large. And Newton was subject to uh, religious discipline at home uh, and at school. There's surviving uh, evidence about his, uh, his discipline at school, his training, his education. And we know that when he went to Trinity College, Cambridge in uh, 1661, uh, he wrote, soon after that, he wrote a, a list of confessions, uh, all the sins or, or bad thoughts he'd ever had. Uh, and th these show uh, or reveal a boy who is um, very devout, uh, very religious, uh, someone who um, has a great desire to be close to God. And we know that this stays with him throughout his life. He died aged 80, 84 in 1727. And this religiosity, I think, pervades his life from his first decade uh, to his last decade. Um, early on, uh, when he was at university, he tried uh, thinking about religion in different ways. Um, he did some work uh, on theology in a, in a work of what we call theological metaphysics, and he explored different uh, ideas, um, many of them uh, responding to the work of Descartes, uh, one of the key ideas Newton had early on uh, was that human beings had been made in the image of God. Of course, it's a very common uh, feature of the, the New Testament, the, the, the Christian Bible. And for Newton, it licensed the idea that uh, human beings had an intellect uh, and reason uh, that had been given by God for a purpose. Um, and I think that it's, it's clear that New from this, I mean, this isn't the only input, but from this, Newton uh, came to think that the world was rationally comprehensible. Uh, soon it would be clear that Newton thought it was rationally comprehensible in mathematical terms and that certain people who used their gifts properly, like himself, um, had the capacity to understand uh, the ways in which God had inscribed the world in mathematical language. Um, and we can see that quite early on. Um, you know, when he's in his late 20s, perhaps. Um, and I think in the parallel universe of, of theological study, uh, we know from an early work published uh, when Newton was slightly older in his early 30s, um, that he thought that he and others had been given a special gift of understanding uh, the Bible, of understanding religion. And God had given Newton and others special group of people uh, the use of reason. Uh, to decode religious mysteries. Here is his, uh, his lodgings at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, the, the great gate is down at the bottom right. You can see the entrance to the college and Newton's rooms are on the right-hand side of that. Uh, that's where he did his, uh, he, he did a lot of work on mathematics, uh, on physics, on um, some work on chemistry or alchemy, but most of the time, um, increasingly from the 1670s, uh, he did work on theology. Uh, in fact, at, at some point in the early 1670s, um, having done these remarkable things that discovered the algorithms of calculus, or the fundamental theorems of calculus, uh, discovered the binomial theorem, uh, discovered the heterogeneity of white light, um, discovered effectively the relationship between uh, the force that applies to objects on the, the surface of the earth and the force that that the earth exerts on the moon to pull it towards them. He showed that those two forces were, were both examples of, a, of, a, of an inverse square law. Uh, having done all that, um, he gave up mathematics and natural philosophy or science in the middle of the 1670s to concentrate on uh, chemistry and, and, uh, and theology, uh, which is a remarkable thing again, um, pulled back only in 1684 by Edmund Halley of Halley's Comet fame to, to start thinking about the relationship between orbital dynamics and the inverse square law. Um, the, the kind of work 
that led him to the Principia Mathematica in 1687. But that's jumping ahead a little bit from the stuff that I want to look at. Um, here is a, a work from the middle of the 1660s uh, when Newton was still an undergraduate, maybe in the last year of uh, being an undergraduate. Uh, and it's, it's one of these things in history that's both a remarkable idiosyncratic text, uh, but also something that's representative of the range of things uh, Newton was thinking about. Um, this, uh, this is called, this is a, a page from his undergraduate notebook called Of the Sun, Stars and Planets uh, and Comets. Um, the top note is from uh, Descartes' uh, Principia Philosophiae, um, whether the sun moves the vortex around it, that, that, that circle with a dot in the middle is, is a word for the sun. So here are some notes on uh, Newton thinking about how the, uh, the solar system uh, works mechanically, according to Descartes. Um, he's interested in the idea of a comet. Um, the next line down, if you go sort of five or six lines down, it, it talks about the Hebrews uh, chapter one, verse two. So in his own mind, he's moved straight from thinking about uh, Cartesian accounts of the vortex to, uh, to thinking about how God made the world through his son. Um, and then again, there's a note, the sun spots are colored sometimes like a rainbow. And then he's got notes on a comet of uh, 1618. Now, why is that? It's because he is writing this in December, 1664. And you can just see at the bottom of that uh, snippet, um, these are his very first notes on astronomy. Um, and th these are notes on the comet of 1664. I, I haven't shown you the bottom of the page, but what they show you is in, in a, a remarkable snapshot, the sort of range of things, the way in which Newton's mind moves from one topic to another uh, in the matter of a, of a page. You can see by the ink, by the way, that, that these are written at different times, but that doesn't really matter. But it shows you that in his mind, one thing follows uh, from another. So he's interested in religion, uh, theology, uh, and the relationship between religion and science from an early age. So as I said, at some point in the 1670s, Newton began to study theology. Uh, he developed a, a radical rational approach to interpreting uh, prophecy and the history of the church. Uh, he believed that a great conspiracy had been foisted on uh, the, the true church by monks and others in the fourth century after Christ. And this involved the intrusion of the doctrine of the Trinity into Christianity and the insertion of Trinitarian passages into the Bible. And this is a remarkably radical way of thinking. Um, it, it, for some people, it's a kind of ultra, ultra Protestant way of thinking. It, it's the, the, the sort of pinnacle or the, the logical conclusion of Protestant um, anti-polytheism or anti-mystery. Um, I, we can talk about this later. I, it, I, I don't think that particular way of thinking is, is necessarily useful, but I think it, it's not necessarily false either. Um, for Newton, and in, again, one has to say how radical this view is, because for the vast majority of Christians, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is what tells you about the relationship between God and his creation. You know, the, the doctrine of the Trinity is the instantiation of uh, God's uh, personal investment, if you like, in his creation through his son. So to deny that doctrine and say that it's um, foisted in by Roman Catholics uh, and that it's the mark of the devil, as Newton says, is a remarkable thing to say. Um, fundamentally, according to Newton, it is polytheistic. The doctrine of the Trinity makes three gods, three separate persons as gods out of one. Uh, and it's uh, fundamentally diabolical, uh, polytheistic, um, and materialistic. Um, driven by these anti-Trinitarian commitments, Newton undertook a, a detailed analysis of church history, and he spent decades uh, attempting to find documentary proof in the historical record uh, within the records of the early Christian church of what he took to be a great uh, Catholic, so proto-Roman Catholic conspiracy uh, to pervert what he thought was the true, simple, original religion. And again, this is a very, uh, if you like, it's an ultra or hyper Protestant view of religion, which is that, you know, the, the true, simple religion was handed down by Jesus Christ to his disciples and to the first Christians in the first two and a half to three 
centuries after Christ. And then these people, these uh, monastics, the monks, the nuns, uh, these others came along and introduced new kinds of doctrine that perverted uh, the simple truths of the first church. Newton argued that the devil had literally come down to earth. I mean, how remarkable is that? The, you know, the, the, the founder of uh, the, the theorems of calculus, binomial theorem, uh, heterogeneity of white light, the author of the Principia Mathematica, at the same time believed that the devil had literally come down to earth uh, in the early fourth century to transform the course of history. Uh, creating a hideous counter-religion uh, by means of his uh, apparatchiks or his acolytes, um, who are kind of leading figures in the creation of orthodox Christianity. For both Protestants and Catholics, it has to be said, you know, people like Athanasius, uh, people like Jerome, uh, all these people who are saints in Roman Catholicism and in high church Anglicanism, you know, for Newton, these are just subjects of the devil, <laughs> are, are either willing or unwilling uh, you know, lackeys of, um, of, of, the, of the master of evil. The Bible itself, as I said, have been corrupted in this manner. Uh, but according to Newton, the actions of righteous people such as himself would fulfill the prophecies in Revelation that told you that in the future, um, good would triumph over evil. Um, Newton thought that maybe in a couple of centuries or maybe two and a half centuries or maybe even three centuries, uh, it would be the end of the world. That's what he said. By the end of the world, he doesn't necessarily mean, although he does say this in some terms, he doesn't necessarily mean that a comet would come in and destroy the earth, as many of his followers came to say. Uh, New for Newton, the end of the world is, is like the political end of the way things have been, which will be followed by a millennium where Jesus Christ reigns with his saints over the mortals who live forever and ever uh, until an infinite period going down the line. I think it's clear that Newton hoped that he was one of those saints who would rule uh, over mortals uh, without the uh, necessity of, a, of, of having a body. I mean, there's one wonderful text where he talks about how wonderful it would be just to float through the universe uh, without a body, how, how right he is. Um, here is... Um, uh, a first page of, of a letter written by uh, Newton to Locke. This is an example of Newton's scriptural exegesis, the way in which he went through um, the Bible looking for uh, texts like 1 John 5, 7 and 1 Timothy 3, 16 and many others. Newton went through the Bible, looked at original manuscripts, looked at the oldest Greek manuscripts, uh, used conventional existing scholarship on these texts, which are proof texts in support of the Trinity, of the doctrine of the Trinity. And Newton went through these texts and in, in association with a, a few other very brave people, he argued, uh, again, in a private letter to John Locke, that all of these proof texts in support of the Trinity uh, are actually um, corruptions foisted in uh, by people in the fourth century and early fifth century. And gradually, um, although they, they started off as being kind of marginal annotations and then got pulled into the main text, into where they are now in, in modern Bibles. And Newton argued that these were all, uh, all corruptions of scripture. There is no, in the original true Bible, there are no references to the Trinity. That's what Newton says. Newton's commitment to studying the Bible uh, and living by its precepts was matched by his study uh, of the numbers and visions of prophecy. Um, now, you might expect this to be the case because Newton was a mathematician and so on and so forth, and he was rational and so on and so forth. But there's no, Newton didn't use um, calculus. He didn't use any sort of higher level algebra in his interpretation of um, the numbers of scripture. Uh, he, he's interested in the use of gematria. So he's, he's actually, strangely enough, again, for someone who we think of as extremely rational, uh, he thinks that certain numbers uh, have various properties. Um, the number seven is, is good. Uh, the number 12 is good. Uh, 12 being disciples uh, of Jesus Christ. There are other numbers like five, 
which are not good because they represent the finger, the, the number of digits on a hand. And so they represent carnality. Um, five times five. So the square of five is 25, which is the square root of a number that's very close to 666. Um, and Newton thought that the, the number 666 pointed the cognoscenti, if you interpreted those numbers correctly, the, the name of the number of the beast, uh, as it says in the Bible, it points people to the, the, to the real nature of the devil who is associated with the, the, the Latin church. So for, for Newton, uh, the, the devil is associated with Roman Catholicism and the numbers 666 tell you that. This is the way the guy thinks. I mean, I, I have to say, I kid you not. This is the way the author of Principia Mathematica thinks. Um, Newton thought that uh, future events had been revealed to inspired people such as himself, not in detail, but the, the general course of history to come had been revealed to people like himself. A rational reading of the apocalypse, that's Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, um, could help people understand the past, present and the future of the world. Like many of his contemporaries, Newton tried to interpret uh, prophetic visions as descriptions of historical events. Um, so all, all, of, all of prophecy in Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah, um, Daniel and Revelation, all of those peculiar visions are descriptions of historical events, if understood properly. They're, they're descriptions of past events, mainly past events. They're descriptions of current events and of events to come. I think uniquely amongst his contemporaries, Newton thought that all of the key visions refer to the fourth and fifth century. It was as if the Protestant Reformation had cleansed nothing. You know, he's part of this. For all, all other Protestant interpreters, Revelation speaks of the, the ongoing destruction of the Pope and his crew. But for Newton, the, Re the Reformation clearly hadn't changed very much. <laughs> you know, the, the, the core... Um, the core diabolical concepts of the Trinity and so on and so forth, they still remained and uh, only the future would get rid of them. He organized all these things into a, a prophetic scheme. Um, here is his main work. Here is his Bible, if you like, in terms of interpretation, the work of his, um, his Cambridge predecessor, Joseph Mead, who tried uh, to uh, what he called methodize or, or put to synchronize various parts of scripture in various, um, in various forms, um, quasi mathematical. This is from Mead, uh, Mead's collected works from the Clavis Apocalyptica, the key to the apocalypse um, of the early 1640s. I mean, Mead had written it slightly earlier, but on the, the, this, this image goes from left to right. Um, if you can see, the, there's a small circle headed Sex Prima Sigilla, so the six first seals uh, on the left, and then the seventh seal, which many of you uh, will have heard of, is, is now exploded in this diagrammatic form uh, into the Sigillum Septimum, the seventh seal, uh, containing the seven trumpets, the Septim Tubas. Uh, and then in this scheme of Mead, if you can see Tuba 1, Tuba 2, Tuba 3 going across the centre, from left to right, that's going chronologically from the earlier stuff to the later stuff. Inside the sixth trumpet, you can see that there are seven files, or at least the first six files lying underneath. Um, they uh, bespeak the, the beast. So the seven vials of wrath in Revelation are poured onto the agents of the devil. And then at some point at the end of the sixth trumpet and the end of the seventh, uh, vial, according to Mead, uh, you get the uh, you, you get the seventh vial, which is the same thing as the millennium. This is what Newton, Newton took so seriously. He took this as seriously as uh, understanding, uh, you know, calculus, uh, the the stuff in Principia Mathematica, that you know, the the, the system of the world, and so on and so forth. Um, here is. Uh, a letter sent to uh, John Locke, which is Newton's own uh, uh, inverse, inverted version of the um, of the, the the scheme you've just seen. In this case, Newton starts off with the earliest stuff at the top, and then goes down, 
um, you can see the first six um, uh, first six uh, trumpets, uh, sorry, the first six um, seals going down on the left hand side. Uh, and then as you go down from halfway down, you get the uh, seven trumpets, uh, which are coterminous for Newton with the seven vials. So the first trumpet refers to the same period as the first vial, second trumpet, same period as the second vial, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can see that Newton is trying to um, rework or reinterpret these things uh, according to his own uh, preconceptions. And this, this was actually sent to John Locke, um, the, the great philosopher and political theorist in 1691, soon after he sent that letter I just showed you to Locke uh, about the interpretation of the Bible in, in November 1690. Um, here is a, an older one where you can see the same image now with much more detail put in. Uh, and for Newton, the, the interpretation of the visions in the Bible um, was something that, by, by which they, they enriched each other, that they were supposed to inform each other in terms of uh, the, the description so that there was nothing left over. I mean, the, the, they, they, they sort of had this um, almost a, a kind of chemical capacity to uh, enrich each other as, as forms of interpretation, according to Newton. And each vision refers to a particular event or period of time. Like almost all his colleagues, Newton believed that the existence and the order of the cosmos was evidence of a divine creator who had made the solar system in, in a Goldilocksian way just right for human beings. And his Principia Mathematica, um, which was understood as, you know, for Newton, the Principia Mathematica was, if you like, a revelation of the language that God had used to um, make the world. You know, this is a living language, a, a language that it, it sort of uh, it, it embodies the way the world is. The world is inscribed in mathematical language and the world for Newton is fundamentally mathematical. It can be described by um, his fundamental laws in the Principia Mathematica. So the, the god of the Principia for Newton was, a, a to, to say the least, a, a mathematically uh, sophisticated being who had created a cosmos that was subject to mathematical laws. And in the, the aftermath of the Principia, uh, Newton had a number of discussions with people, uh, particularly the, uh, the, the scholar Richard Bentley. Um, and Newton was, was pushed into thinking about the, the nature of the, the cosmos. You know, how is it? And, and these are very relevant thoughts, I think, for a number of people today. You know, how is it that, that we, uh, as human beings, uh, emerged um, in, in a world where um, the, the possibility of life is, uh, is so small. Um, you know, we, the, the, the fact that we're in this Goldilocksian zone, three rocks out from the sun, and that everything coheres and hangs together in such a, a, an amazingly mathematically perfect way could not have arisen by chance. Although Newton did say that the, the universe required divine intervention from time to time. And as I alluded earlier on, he did also say that, um, and I think this is, this is more remarkable than his view that there was life on other planets or that there had to be life in other solar systems. I mean, Newton's view, uh, like others, is that ev every star that you see in the sky is a star system that must have planets around it that support life um, because God wouldn't have wasted the chance of of, of, of using these places to support life. Um, and on those other planets, probably God created beings not too dissimilar from us. But every so often, possibly because human beings uh, get idolatrous, that they don't receive the word of God, they don't live like good Christians uh, or, or whatever, uh, God destroys these worlds. And there's some wonderful um, private documents where Newton talks about uh, how uh, the satellites of Jupiter are actually um, sort of uh, Earth's in training. You now God pings a comet into the sun, there's a supernova, destroys the first three or four planets in the solar system. God then you know, picks out one of the satellites of Jupiter, puts it in the place of Earth, you know, gives it an initial motion, you know, maintains gravitational attraction, and there is a new creation. 
But that, that's fundamentally heretical. Uh, the idea that there's life on other planets is not heretical, but, but um, the idea of a new creation is. Here's an image of Newton from 1702, same painter as the one we saw at the beginning. Um, 1702, Newton, uh, now, now master of the mint, he's head of the Royal Mint, um, making money. Uh, he's one year off from being president of the Royal Society. Um, he's three years off from being knighted for services to his government and the state, not for services to science. Um, in the 18th century, Newton's uh, religiosity was known by many, uh, especially his close friends. And it became a, a, a very, it's a fascinating job for his friends and admirers, uh, as much as for his enemies, to reconcile his, his highly original views um, with uh, the, the need for someone like Newton to be seen to be uh, fundamentally orthodox. Um, people in this period, even if it's Newton, they don't like um, they don't like radical heterodox people um, who don't believe in the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, the fact that Newton had supported natural theology, which of course is is, is a great proof of the existence of God, uh, made him a very useful person to have for the Church of England because he's supporting, you know, effectively Newton's work suggests that if you don't believe in God, you're an idiot. The French and others, the French and Italians use his work very differently. Uh, they use it to support the idea that, that human beings have the capacity to make their own world, um, to make their own laws. Uh, and fundamentally, Newton was used to support anti-clerical doctrine. And the French and some Italians used, um, attributed his religious studies to uh, his later career and even to senility or, or dementia. Uh, and again, that, that view, I think, is very uh, influential. Uh, here's a picture of Newton as an old man, or two pictures of Newton as a, as a very old man, 17, mid 1720s, uh, hasn't got long to go. Uh, on the left hand side is actually an image from the third edition of Principia of 1726, published just before he died. Um, so against the Enlightenment view that Newton was a saintly genius, um, commentators in the 19th century continued to absorb new information uh, about Newton's less than saintly demeanor. You know, new information came out suggesting that Newton was, um, had behaved like a rotten bastard, I think is the one way of putting it. Um, so he wasn't a saint. And also it became clear that he had got these, these hideous heterodox ideas. And it became very difficult for people in the 19th century to, to reconcile this genius with this saintly virtue. And, and those two ideas become uh, disaggregated or picked apart in the middle of the, the 19th century. And increasingly in the late 19th century, his religious work was demeaned as valueless and irrelevant to his scientific and mathematical work, a view that was bolstered by the gift of only the scientific and mathematical papers to the nation, uh, that is to Cambridge University in 1872. The rest of the papers remained uh, in private uh, until they were sold off in 1936. And you know, the majority of his alchemical papers are in um, King's College, Cambridge, and nearly all his theological papers are now uh, something that Newton probably would have appreciated there in the, the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem. Um, so just to finish, uh, the papers that uh, Newton left behind in, that are now in Jerusalem show that he was working hard on theological topics very early on in his career. So against the uh, enlightenment view of that the, his theological studies were the product of dotage or senility. We know that he was spending uh, most of his time at the peak of his career studying theology uh, and alchemy. Um, what's the relationship between science and religion? It's a very difficult question for Newton. Uh, he argued privately that theology and natural philosophy were completely distinct domains and had different modes of proof. Um, you, you, could, uh, you could get very, very talented, brilliant uh, Islamic and Jewish scholars uh, who are quite capable of understanding and developing uh, Newton's views on um, mathematics and so on and so forth. But these people are never going to uh, accept Newton's views about the proof of the, uh, the, the truth of Christianity. Yeah, the, the, the modes of proof, the things that are being proved are, are completely different in, in both worlds. 
Similarly, the, the Bible was written for common people and was not scientific. One shouldn't expect scientific truth in the Bible. I mean, after all, it's geocentric, whereas we know that, that we live in a sun-centered cosmos. Uh, and conversely, uh, the Principia Mathematica was, was not written for common people, uh, but was written for experts. And there's a language that is appropriate to talking about, um, to, to talking about the world as it really is, and not how we as common people experience it. But there are many areas where science and religion were closely related to each other. Uh, one of these is in his view of, a, of an ancient, uh, the original of religions. He talked about places like Stonehenge, um, which he thought were you know, circular uh, places. You find them in Denmark, um, Spain, uh, even China, he said. Um, and the, these were indications that the most ancient people had a, a rational Newtonian religion. Um, and similarly, in, in his uh, methodological uh, accounts of the world or, or how to proceed, um, we, we know that he valued independence. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't take for granted what authorities say. Um, find your own way, uh, whether you're doing natural philosophy or, or religion, because that's what it is. You, you've been given a gift. You have an obligation to do that. And also, uh, on the other side, one has to avoid human fictions. Uh, one has to avoid mistaking uh, one's own views, one's own pet theories or hypotheses or systems, whether you're in theology or natural philosophy. You have to develop techniques for avoiding mistaking those for the products of God. Um, and one of, the, one of the problems with human beings is they get passionate, they get enthusiastic in the 17th century meaning of the term. Uh, and that, that passion uh, colors their way of thinking. You have to um, devise techniques of the self to find truth. And I think just this is the last claim uh, of, of the talk. The natural philosopher, i.e. Newton and others, had special capacities to discern and decode the word of God. And there's a number of things follow from that, I, but I won't go into detail. I'll just say Newton saw himself as, a, as part of a, a band of, of a new kind of expert, uh, a, a new kind of... Um, experts in science or natural philosophy who had something to say about religion. And what you can see, I think, from a disciplinary perspective is that Newton is the latest in a long line of people uh, whose work is eroding uh, spaces and capacities that had traditionally been the preserve of divines. Um, you know, by making the, the, the role of the natural philosopher uh, religious, uh, by, making, by turning them into priests of nature, they were eroding or, or um, at least calling into question the boundaries and the capacities of, of traditional uh, theologians. So that uh, is the end of the talk. I will just point you to um, the Newton Project. If you Google Newton Project, you'll find um, most of these things uh, that I've been talking about. And you can, in, in, the, in a Newtonian way, you can uh, do your own research and find your own way and make new discoveries and so on and so forth. So thank you for listening. Terrific. Thank you very much indeed, Professor. I think that's um, certainly inspired me to learn a little bit more about um, Newton's life and legacy, especially as I think as, that's taught, as the talk has revealed, it's um, certainly shown that there was more to him and his way of seeing the world than perhaps we first um, appreciate. Um, I suppose I'd like to kick off with um, a first question about how these views themselves were received. Um, and I'd like to um, know, um, did other people sort of know that Newton had these sort of slightly left of field um, views when it comes to religion? And did it at all have any impact on his career as first a prominent scientific figure and then a sort of prominent member of the political scene in England? Um, that's a very good question. I think that the, there are three answers to the first part very quickly. The, there are people who are hostile to the kinds of thing Newton believes, and they suspect that Newton has been spending too much time with known anti-Trinitarians. Uh, and they think that the, 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 their views have kind of rubbed off on him. <coughs> but they, they don't realize, I think, that Newton is actually the source of a lot of the, the views of some of these people. Um, the second thing is that there are people who are more interesting, perhaps, who come from Transylvania and places where Socinianism or 
a form of anti-Trinitarianism is, is rife and they come and visit Newton. Uh, so they must know that he has these views. Um, the third thing to say is the vast majority of people, uh, I think, uh, have different ways of dealing with Newton's heterodoxy. Um, some of them suspect or know that he's got these views, but they say, look, the, the Church of England allows a wide variety of opinion. Uh, Newton's faith was expressed in his uh, philosophical work. Um, we should celebrate the man for his independence. Um, and then there are other people who say, look, there's no evidence that he was uh, one of these uh, heterodox, uh, heretical people. I mean, his views aren't just heterodox, they're formally heretical. I mean, I should make that absolutely clear. And if in the early 18th century, his views had been uh, acknowledged by Newton publicly, he would, have, he would never have been uh, master of the mint, president of the Royal Society. He could never have been knighted. He could never have appeared in public in the way he did. I mean, he would have been socially ostracized. Um, so it matters to him to keep these views quiet. Uh, it, it matters to people in the Church of England that he is one of their own, to use a, a, a very, very appropriate football term. Um, <laughs> um, he, is, um, he, he is somebody who uh, did attend the Church of England uh, on occasion. I mean, Newton's views about what the doctrines of the Church of England are are very interesting, and they are exceptionally latitudinarian. That means to say he thinks that people who have views like his own, you know, denying the doctrine of the Trinity should be allowed in the Church of England. But of course he is, um, as they say in the, in the joke, opinion is divided, you know, on that one. Newton thought that and nobody else did. Um, if you go into the uh, 19th century, then as I said, his views uh, a lot of his private views come out and make it impossible to believe that he was orthodox. Uh, and, and then I think that that happens at the same time as you get this split between, you know, positivist split 1840s and 50s, where uh, but you could call this secularization, if you like, but um, Newton's work on science and mathematics it is simply taken to be uh, the, the way in which we should remember him. And all the other stuff gets gets relegated to, to the side. And it's only in the last 20 odd years that um, we've been able to see the totality of, of what he did. And it, and it, it, it is all online. Um, everything he wrote in theology is online. So you can see just how radical uh, he is. Unfortunately, he didn't date his work. So it's difficult in some cases to see how his work develops over time. Um, but we, we know that very early on, um, he already had these radical thoughts, partly because we can date uh, a lot of those uh, prophetic documents. And some of the doctrines in those prophetic documents require him already to have become an anti-Trinitarian. So we, we know that. Professor, uh, one question. Obviously, he has all of this um, idea that there is a great conspiracy in, in the church or foisted on the church by monks and, and, and other men of, the, of religion. Um, how did that affect his views, uh, not only on religion, but at the same time, knowing that he can never come out uh, and say what he thinks, um, how did he conciliate his scientific work knowing that um, probably if people know what he thinks about religion, uh, most of the stuff he came up will be probably discredited. Um, I, mean, well, I think you've, you've asked a question that, that, that requires a long answer, but I, I think what we would love to know more about is the way in which he engaged in uh, what's called scribal publication which is not a, in some ways, it's not a useful term, but what it means is that uh, Newton disdained print. You know, he had no time for print. He thought it was pearls before swine. Um, what he was interested in was disseminating his work to a very uh, trustworthy, knowledgeable audience, something like a collegiate audience of friends. Um, and we, we know that he must have had these very intimate, conversations with people where, like the one with Locke that I refer to, where he's he's probing people to find out how trustworthy they are. 
and we, we can see that brilliantly in in the letter to Locke in the exchange between Locke and Newton where you know Locke has similarly heterodox ideas but nothing as uh, nothing as radical or insane as Newton's um, I say insane as a joke not that I believe what he said um, but the, but this this cat and mouse probing of other people I think is is a really remarkable feature of Newton so his work does uh, disseminate to other people um, and he has a, a you know a trusted group of people who keep these who keep the the exact content of these views secret but there is a penumbra of people who know that he believes some strange things I don't think they know exactly how strange they are um, how he manages the uh, the relationship between his scientific publications and uh, and his private theological views. I mean, he published virtually nothing on theology in his life. Um, there are one or two things that we see references in the queries to optics in three separate editions of optics. 1704 is the first English edition, 1706, which is the key one in a way is the Latin opticate you know, being Latin, it goes across Europe and is investigated. And then 1717, he says some more things, but it's the general scolium at the end of the 1713 second edition of Principia, where he says some very interesting things about God. And there are some footnotes to that general scolium where he talks about idolatry. And, and if you know what he believes in private, you can read those footnotes as references uh, to uh, to, to his own private views, which are rather uh, radical and heterodox. But as one historian has said, you know, virtually nobody could see through the scolium. Um, you, you couldn't, you know, unless you knew that he was already uh, radical, you wouldn't know that these things referred uh, to his radical private views. Um, and I think that his views weren't really known until the year after he died when one of his disciples basically blew open uh, the fact that Newton believed all these things. But then people were unwilling to believe his disciples' views. I think Leibniz has some insights into Newton after a while, but I, I, I could talk about that if people are interested. But the, the Clark Leibniz correspondence, particularly Leibniz's fifth letter, uh, you can see in a way, you know, Leibniz is close to death. I think he's only a couple of months away. I think he's got a sense that he's dying. And in, in a very sort of uh, unusual form of writing for Leibniz, Leibniz basically says there's something very strange about Newtonianism. You know, there, there's something, and he uses the word kingdom of, the phrase kingdom of darkness, which is the, the scriptural reference to the kingdom of the devil. Leibniz says that about Newton, and I think he smells something very nasty about Newton's doctrines. Professor, we have a, a question uh, from someone who is watching us live from Umberto. Uh, he asks, how aware nonconformists uh, of that time were of each other? Locke, for example, was openly accused of being heretic or anti-Trinitarian. Did these nonconformists try to contact each other I mean, somehow? Um, that's a very good question because people always ask me whether Newton was a member of a Unitarian church because the, you know, the, the, the Toleration Act of 1689, um, in the wake of the Glorious Revolutions, uh, opens up the possibility of having, you know, under very uh, constrained circumstances, but you can, um, you, you, you can do things in relation to, um, being part of a group, you, you can express Unitarian ideas in a way that you couldn't do previously. Um, there are different kinds of nonconformists. You know, the, there are people, <clears throat> Newton is on the rational side, if, if to, to, be, to be very crude. Um, most of the nonconformists, think of them as Quakers or uh, Baptists and others. I mean, Newton had serious problems with them. Um, I, I think because of the the, uh, the inspirationalism, the emotionalism, uh, and the passion that's there, the the, the appeal to the uh, the inspired self is completely antithetic to what Newton believes. Um, for for Newton, it, it's about the use of reason um, 
and th th there's a wonderful uh, paragraph where it's, it's almost a unique paragraph where Newton is, uh, you know, um, where he, he's slightly reflective about these things, but Newton talks about how uh, a, a, a attaining free will, which is what the Christian should aim for, um, a free will in, in the way that Jesus Christ attained, so the, the, the capacity to truly tell the difference between good and evil, which is the mark of the, um, the, the experienced godly man, that requires reason. You know, that requires this lifelong disciplining of the self. Um, and the, the idea that you could just lazily uh, quake or, or have inspiration uh, is, is complete anathema to him. I mean, he, he would be somebody who thought that that kind of thinking gives rise to political sectarianism uh, and ultimately anarchy, the anarchy of the civil wars. But the, do, do these people know of each other? Um, that, that's a very, that is a very good question because you know, when we do the history of these things, um, people tend to write the history of baptism, the history of you know, Unitarianism or the history of uh, Quakerism, um, there are groups who are related to each other. So, for example, Quakerism and, uh, and Judaism. So Jews and Quakers go together. Um, they, they find solace in each other, particularly in the Netherlands. Um, there are other groups and, and anti-Trinitarians also uh, find solace with other groups. Um, but it, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's what the um, kind of high church people, the Orthodox would have seen as a kind of a set of hives of dangerous people um, or swarms <laughs> of, of these dangerous non-conformists. And I think uh, some of them make temporary alliances and, and some, of them, some of them don't. And I think the other thing you have to remember in this period is um, it, it, political views and religious views uh, are very similar to each other, not in terms of doctrine or content, but because uh, people who have what are considered heterodox or unorthodox or unacceptable religious views clearly are people who want to push for some kind of toleration. Uh, you know, the, the, so political views and religious views go hand in hand. Um, and particularly, I think, when you've had the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil Wars, people who exist after that, they, they, they accept kinds of constraint uh, and persecution as, as a necessary evil to offset war in a ways that they wouldn't have done before the wars happened. And I think you have to bear that in mind as well. Terrific, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on the discussion now um, to the methodology of understanding Newton's um, religious views and particularly um, the sources that we have available to be able to uh, shine some light on this. So I suppose my next question would be, um, what sort of sources um, are generally available? Um, what are the sort of opportunities and challenges um, that these provide um, and actually trying to reconstruct Newton's views? I appreciate you've um, drawn on some of these themes already, but I'd be grateful if you could please um, expand out on them a little bit more. Um, well, I think there are, there are a couple of things. One is the, uh, the internal order of Newton's thought. Um, you know, whether it's within theology or within his work as a whole. Uh, one of the things that's always interested me, and I try to bring that out a tiny bit, is um, whether Newton's thought is fundamentally coherent in any sense. You know, is there a relationship between his work in mathematics and his work in alchemy uh, and his work in theology, for example, or are they fundamentally separate? And one of the ironies or paradoxes is that the, the kind of a historical positivist view, which I mentioned, which sees effectively the scientific mathematical work as, as the only thing that matters and the rest is dross. I mean, that, that assumes a kind of division between different areas, which is not a million miles away from the sorts of thing that I and one or two others believe, which is that Newton did compartmentalize his work and that there are distinctions between different areas of his work. And it follows from that, that, that the effort to try and find connections between his work 
uh, will, I think, ultimately inevitably end up telling you more about the person who's trying to find the connections between the work. I mean, this is the sort of Calvinist thing that Newton uh, was worried about, you know, that, that people, uh, this is the fundamental part of, of uh, Calvinism, which is that we are hardwired to mistake the products you know, we're, we're hardwired to idolat idolatrously mistake the products of our own mind for something that's out there that is divinely created. That's who we are. That, that's a consequence of original sin. Um, so the first thing I'd say is, you know, compartmentalism versus uh, connectionism. I mean, how do we deal with that? Uh, and I think that there's, there's wonderful potential from uh, artificial intelligence to, to find connections between areas of his work that we can't find. I mean, AI is just as capable of um, uh, idolatrously finding things that aren't there and mistaking the products of its own, uh, you know, uh, adversarial networks as, as we are. Um, the second thing is, you know, what did Newton read? How do we understand the context in which he read? For someone who's fiercely independent and leaves very few clues about his work, I mean, how do we understand the social, contextual, world in which Newton works you know who is he talking to he does talk to people we know that um and yet if he's talking to people about some topics how can he do that without revealing that he's this very strange man because you know there aren't there aren't many people he's a professor of mathematics at uh, Cambridge he's the Lucasian professor of mathematics he doesn't have to do any theology at all and yet he's doing as much theology as any of the divines the the professional theologians in Oxford or Cambridge I mean, that's, that's astonishing, right? He's doing more work than they are. He knows more about the fourth and fifth century than they do. I mean, what he knows is, is hideous as far as they're concerned, because um, he has this complete kind of mirror counter history, but it's fascinating, you know, it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, uh, internal coherence and context is are the two things that, uh, professor, uh, I promise this is the last question because I told you that it's in, it will be for, for an hour, but this subject is so so interesting. Um, do you think that all of Newton's views and the way he expressed, obviously, to a small audience, let's say, about his views, and do you think he ever aimed to have a, a sort of God's in the end of his life, a sort of God's spiritual way of uh, uh, having like, uh, or being in, in, a, in a level, um, uh, maybe like God, I would say, something of, of that level. If, if by thinking that way or with all of his, uh, the, the way he thinks uh, and uh, all of his strong opinions, if he ever aimed something like that so, or, or to reach that level of our no, holy, think... let's say. Um, I, I, th I think that's the one of the most interesting features of this, you know, which is, and, and it's, it's a problem for Newton, it's a problem for his followers. Um, they all knew Newton's views about idolatry. Newton knows his own views about idolatry. Um, who is he modeling himself on? He's not Jesus Christ, he knows that. Um, is he an angel? Uh, is he a saint? Uh, I don't know, he's not an angel. I don't think he doesn't think he's an angel. I think he thinks he's a saint or he could be a saint and obviously not a Roman Catholic saint. Um, but a, a, what he would count as a real saint, you know, someone who had uh, done what's required or, or he could be a prophet. He, um, so one of the interesting things to consider is, is what model is he, you know, who is he in Christian history? In sacred history, what role is he playing in a way that's described in the Bible. You know, for him and for other Protestants, the Bible is the history of the world uh, to be encoded by the people that come, to, de to be decoded by the people that come afterwards. You know, who is he? Um, he has to be very careful about being idolatrous. And his followers, there's some wonderful, uh, there's some wonderful efforts by would-be biographers to describe who he is. Uh, he was born on Christmas Day, 1642. Uh, a, a, as someone else was, <laughs> uh, a, a, according to um, some people's views. Um, he, 
you know, for his followers, he's incredibly virtuous. He has saintly virtues. Um, his discoveries are much more significant than any other findings that anyone has ever found. He's a national hero for the English and for the British. Um, and yet they, 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 can't, they can't work out in the same way that Newton couldn't. They can't work out where he is supposed to be in the pantheon of uh, religious entities, right? Who is he? What is he? So one way of thinking about this is that the, the idea of genius uh, is invented in the 1750s to solve that problem. The idea of a scientific genius, which, which comes, I think, into fruition in the 1760s and 70s across Europe, I think is, is invented to solve that problem with regard to Newton. And of course, it's also invented as a way of um, almost in a kind of dialectical response to uh, democratic and equalitarian movements that are taking hold in the 1770s and 80s. You know, the, the emergence of the intellectual aristocrat happens at exactly the same time and necessarily happens at the same time as these other movements uh, come into being. Um, but I, I think that the, the scientific genius to begin with has the characteristics of a saint. Um, and then it, that, that's unpicked in the middle of the 19th century, as I said, when it becomes clear that, you know, the way Newton treated Robert Hooke, uh, John Flamsteed and many others was, um, you know, beyond disgraceful. You can't, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's, he's a nasty man. But of course, Newton's followers think he's, uh, certainly during his lifetime, think he had the, the whitest soul of any man they'd ever seen. <laughs> I mean, he splits opinion. Nobody is neutral on Newton. True. Professor, thank you so, so much. Um, I don't know if you want to do any final remarks because we don't want to take more of, more of your time. Um, if you want to end with any final remarks, please uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for your time tonight uh, in the name of the group, obviously. Thank you so much. Can I just say thanks for inviting me and um, uh, I, I do, uh, again, without being, I, I don't want to be a self promoter, I, I really despise that, but anyone who wants to look at some of the stuff on the Newton project, um, I, I think you, you can have as much or as little um, um, as you want <laughs> of, of Newton. Uh, and um, you, you can see, you know, it's a remarkable uh, archive really uh, it's one of the sort of four or five largest archives that's available to study of anyone before 1750. What I would say is obviously I will provide when the the, um, the the video will go live on Facebook I will provide the link on the description so just pay yeah. att attention on the description everything will be there okay. Okay thanks very much. Thank you once again professor thank you for your time and thank you uh, everyone with which is watching us and until next confabulating. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.